going to introduce Rich Sheridan. Rich Sheridan is the CEO and Chief Storyteller at Menlo Innovations. He's a personal friend, mentor, and canvas for the entrepreneurial community here in Ann Arbor, and also the creator of one of the best places to work and fastest growing companies as reported by the Wall Street Journal and Inc. Magazine. He's been nominated for Entrepreneur of the Year three times, and if all that doesn't impress you, he's also now an author. He's here today to introduce his new book, Joy Inc., so let's give him a warm welcome. Hour. How many of you want to start your own company someday? Awesome. I wanted to from the time I was a little kid. I had dreams about a company when I was walking on the streets of Ann Arbor. I can remember very specifically imagining a place like this when I was 21 years old, walking up and down State Street near Nichols Arcade as a student in the computer science program here at Michigan. If you're taking any classes, if you're reading any books about entrepreneurship, you know you're supposed to be working now, not on a business plan, but on a business model canvas. But most organizations don't think about their culture. They think maybe that's the thing you get to later. That's the thing that once we have time, once we have enough revenue, once we have enough team members, we should start thinking about our culture. But I will tell you, you need to start thinking about your culture right from the start. That should be part of the business model canvas. It should be part of your thinking. And you probably already know what kind of company you want to create because it's in here. It's what you want to do. What you saw in that video was the place I want to work. Menlo is, in many ways, a very personally selfish journey for me. I built the company I want to work in. It's very fortunate that it can also be a noble journey in the sense that there are other people who want to work there too. It would be kind of a lonely place if it was just me. What if you could see a culture? What if you could touch a culture? What if the culture was composed of things that surprise you, especially for a software company? <clears throat> what if your culture included tools that look like this? And what if all those cultural elements fit into the actual business? What if it helped you deliver what you wanted to deliver to the world? Talking about joy inside of Menlo, seeing that place is kind of vulnerable, I have to tell you. The very first time I ever 
said to one of our tour groups, welcome to Menlo, you've come to a place that is very intentional, created a culture focused on the business value of joy. I have to admit, I felt pretty naked at that moment. It's kind of a vulnerable declaration. Maybe it's the sort of thing that most people keep in the back of their minds and they say, I'm not supposed to share this with people who are going to hear about us in the world. I'm not supposed to share it with potential clients. They want to know how cheap I'm going to be, or how fast I'm going to be, or how good I'm going to be, or how maybe technically competent our programmers are, or how wonderful our designers are. But really, you want to talk about joy? And so much like I did in the video, I asked the first two a group, I said, well, pretend half of that team has joined the other half dozen. Which half do you want working on your project? And of course they said they want the joyful half of my team. And I said, why? Why does it matter? Why do you care? What difference would it make? And they went right to the heart of business value. They said they'd be more engaged. They'd be more productive. They'd care more about the outcome. They'd produce better results. There would be higher quality. We'd get more done for less money. I said, awesome, you're with me. There isn't that tangible business value to joy. And I've been talking about joy ever since, including in a book. I was thinking of doing the t-shirt thing with the books. How many more? But understand for us that joy translates to the effect we want to have in the world, which goes back to the heart of what I wanted to do when I was that 21-year-old computer science student in Michigan back in 1978. It goes back a long ways. I wanted to deliver great, working, beautiful, usable software to the world. That, for me, is joyful. To have somebody stop you on the sidewalk and say, really, you guys built that? I love that thing. And I think as an engineer, this goes to the heart of why we get into the profession in the first place. There's hard work inside of engineering. Whatever type of engineering you do, there's long <coughs> efforts that produce hopefully great results, but one day you want people to look at the bridge, look at the building, look at the software, look at the car, and say, really? You did that? I love that thing. That for us is the definition of joy. And we get that based on a cultural intention that we were very clear from right from the beginning. And now I think we're gonna have David Thompson come out here and talk with me a little bit before we give you guys a chance to talk. Yeah, feel free to have a seat, Rich. It's great to have you here. <clears throat> I tried to do some research and preparation of our time together to see if, in fact, um, Vikings were more <laughs> joyful. <laughs> Are so, they? I, I'm I don't know. curious. No, I'm, I didn't find any have, data on it. I have no idea. It frightens me to death to do any research on Vikings. <laughs> I feel better right now, I can tell you that. Uh, it's fun this. wearing a plastic Viking no, helmet, isn't but, it? But seriously, what is this about? Um, yeah, and my daughter, I think, is somewhere in the room. And she does not want me putting on that Viking helmet if I'm being filmed. <laughs> I put it on. Uh, <laughs> I put it on. It's fun. Um, so uh, the Viking helmet is now an iconic symbol of Menlo. Uh, it actually made the centerfold of Inc. Magazine. Imagine that. Uh, this little plastic $7 Viking helmet from USToys.com. It has become the thing that has defined us, which is interesting, because it has a very simple practical value for us. As you saw in the video, we worked two to a computer. You may have remembered that there was a big circle of people standing around uh, the room at one point in the video, and that is our daily stand-up meeting. That's where we report out. Um, quite frankly, and if you haven't been in the work world, this won't make as much sense as it will to you one day. We hate meetings. Anybody with me on that one? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so we hold them standing up. We control them with a token. Because we work in pairs, having a two-handled token is really convenient as the people report out because they hold each of the token handles like this as they report out what they're working on and where they need help and then it moves on to the next people and it goes around the circle and whoever has the Viking helmet is in control of the meeting. It's very democratic. Um, and uh, when it gets around to the last people in the circle, uh, they set it down, say be careful out there and we get back to work and typically this meeting lasts 13 minutes. 
and it can have 50 or 60 people in it. And I defy most companies, most organizations to begin a meeting of 60 people in 13 minutes, let alone call it assemble it, start it, hold it, give everyone a chance to talk, get done, get back to work, 13 minutes. Uh, we think meetings are mind-numbing, spirit-sucking, energy-draining devices of management, so we pretty much eliminated them except for that. So, one. Rich, what do you really feel about meetings? That's yeah. what I want to know. You know? Yeah, and, I, and I used to run those <laughs> meetings, and I knew that nobody wanted to be there because when I didn't show up for work, they wouldn't hold the meeting. And I realized, oh, cr crap, you know, I've created this thing that they only come because the boss is there. And I'm like, let's be done with that. There's no value to the people on the team. But, but say if I'm there and I, I want to hold a meeting with one or two of my colleagues, how do I pull that off? Yeah, so uh, we, we, um, we all sit down in a big open room. Uh, there are no cubes, offices, walls, or doors. That's inclusive of me. I just have a table out in the middle of the room. And when we communicate internally, even if it's casual, uh, we don't use electronics. We don't use email. Uh, we don't use texting. Uh, we use what we like to call high-speed voice technology. It's awesome. Uh, hardware's built right in. <laughs> Vocal cords, body language, eyebrows. Uh, and so if I want to have a meeting with David, I, no matter how far away you are, I just say, hey, David. And you say, hey, hey Rich. Rich. Yeah, exactly. Now we're in a meeting. Okay. And we don't have to move. Right. Uh, and I can actually uh, I, I can teach you this methodology, okay? <laughs> uh, here's what we're going to do. We're going to demonstrate an all-company meeting at Menlo. I'm going to say, hey, Menlo. You're going to say, hey, Rich. Okay, you with me? Hey, Menlo. Hey, Rich. Boom. It's just the way it is at Menlo. Everybody goes dead quiet, and we're in an all-company meeting. Nobody moved. Then we transact the business of the meeting. Maybe we want a new deal. Uh, and we just say, hey, we want a new deal. Everybody cheers. Maybe a couple of questions get asked. And then I say, thank you very much. And the meeting's done. And everybody goes right back to work. OK, but it's a little bit of an intrusion. And if I'm working on a project, right? I mean, sure, how do you deal yeah. with Yeah. Uh, so you know, people wonder, you know, isn't this like very interrupting? Uh, what's interesting is we all have the experiences that tell us it's actually not interruptive. And uh, you probably had this experience today. You were at a coffee shop this morning. You were working with one of your colleagues, uh, one of your co-students on a project or getting ready for class. And you were heads down. You were in a conversation in that coffee shop. And there's all this noise going on around you. Um, and uh, um, and uh, you weren't paying attention to any of it. But what's interesting is if I say, hey, David, across a noisy room, your brain is programmed to hear that. You didn't hear anything else. If I said, hey, Jim, or hey, Bob, or hey, Bill, you didn't even hear it. Brain is an amazing filter. There's part of our brain called the reticular activator that just throws that stuff away. I'd say that's true. Uh, OK, so th th I, I, accepting that's true, I'm in a big room full of people, um, that might work for me because I'm an extrovert. but. Sure. What about the introvert? I mean, a yeah. lot of people, a lot of action and noise. Yeah. yeah, in fact, there's a lot of books written these days on the subject of introversion and how uh, we should actually put engineers in sensory deprivation chambers, uh, <laughs> let them put earbuds in their ears and silently click away on keyboards and uh, turn the lights down low. I actually get invited into a lot of these places and they walk me through this sea of darkened cubicles. And uh, we get to the corner office, and the CIO closes the door and says, so before we get started, I want to talk about our communication challenges here. <laughs> like, think? really? You think it's because nobody's talking to one another? No, we've installed all the latest electronic gadgetry to make sure they can communicate with one another. And the fact of the matter is that, um, uh, you know, and again, I'm not an expert at this stuff, but what I find is that I don't think Menlo would work unless it was filled with introverts. Because introverts, it's not that they don't want relationships with other people. They want fewer, deeper relationships. And because we work in pairs and we switch the pairs every five days and we assign the pairs, uh, which relieves a lot of social anxiety about, you know, uh, the, the kids who went into... Pick me, pick me. Yeah, yeah right? well, or worse, um, you know, I remember as a kid um, uh, being the... I loved baseball. Uh, but I was this engineering mindset, so I was heading off in another non-athletic direction in my life. And so I was often the last kid picked. And there's nothing worse than always being the last kid picked for the baseball team. You just eventually stop showing up. And so we didn't want to have that ostracizing kind of effect at Menlo. So we assigned the pairs. And now we're in a relationship with one another for five working days. 
And so you assign it on a what Friday afternoon for Monday yep. morning. Yeah, okay. Monday morning everybody knows. You may, we might find out we're paired together. We work together for five days, and then the pairs switch. But what about the projects? I mean, the projects aren't all five-day projects. No, the projects aren't five-day projects. I'm going to just grab an artifact yeah, here sure. while we're talking. Um, By the way, I'm seeing the uh, the horns here on the book too, Rich. Just pointed out. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you. Penguin was not going to let it go that this <laughs> iconic symbol would probably draw attention to it. Uh, this is how we do project planning here, Dave. Um, and the projects are actually smaller than five days. This is a two-day project, so 16 hours worth of work. This is a one-day project. De devil's advocate for a moment. You're a computer <laughs> technology company, right? Yes. And this is paper. This is paper, exactly. Okay. What's the problem? So, yeah, so, so uh, I don't understand. walk me through this a little bit. This <laughs> seems to be a joy sucker, not a joy. Uh, yeah, uh, it's messy, it. right? Uh, yeah. We are good recyclers. Okay. We, we really do well <laughs> at that. Um, so, in, uh, in our mission statement, uh, the part I don't necessarily always parade out because I'd rather be remembered for joy than for this other part of our mission statement, our mission is to end human suffering in the world as it relates to technology. And there's plenty of it out there. How many of you use Wolverine Access? <laughs> no comment. Yeah. Technological suffering at work. Okay. <laughs> you know. Uh, now, granted, the Wolverine Access. Uh, you know, um, if it isn't easy to register for classes, I mean, how much? You know, how common is it that a student at the university would want to register for classes? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's the heart of the business value proposition at the university. But um, uh, so we ended up choosing tools like this that we believe work better for humans. And humans are tactile creatures. We have all these little nerve endings in our fingers, and we touch this paper, and it's handwritten because it engages a different part of your brain. And people like to play puzzle games, and this is how we. Decide but on the, what's the project going to be is two and a half days. I'm still stuck there, so some are shorter than five. We have no projects that are longer than five days. We have projects that have been going on for eight years. So but how we, does it work? Yeah, we, we plan them five days at a time. Uh, we'll often plan well into the future. Uh, we don't only plan the next five days, but we the next five days is very important to us because what people would really prefer in any work environment is to work in a, an environment of no ambiguity. And yeah, most of us operate in total ambiguity at work, right? You go to work and, you know, the boss, you know, you got some, the company's headed in a direction, the department has some goals, you have some function that you're doing, but you have no idea what you're supposed to do today, right now. These simple paper-based tools make it entirely clear what the, what the whole team is going to be working on the next five business days. Do clients like it? Most of them. Well, let's say the ones that uh, become Menlo clients like <laughs> it. Uh, and, uh, you know, but they see the, the uh, look, there's not a project in the history of man that ever fit within the time and budget everyone wanted it to. I, I often joke that we were going to build five pyramids, but we only got three done. It was free labor, it was ubiquitous materials, but we still only got three out of five pyramids done. Uh, software projects are like this. Um, anybody hear of a government website that was having a little trouble lately? Um, <laughs> kind of missed the deadline. You know, President of the United States had to come out and talk about glitches in software. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> we're now at the point where the president has to tell us why my industry sucks. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, this simple tool is really kind of cool because, again, I didn't bring over all my artifacts here. If the client wants us to work on this piece, it doesn't fit in the plan, so it can't go on the plan because it doesn't fit in the time and the budget, so it sits off to the side. It stays over here on the table, and it becomes entirely clear what did not fit in the plan and what did fit in the plan, and that's why we use these simple paper-based artifacts so we know what's in, what's out, what's highest priority, what's second highest priority. Maybe that comes in later. It's And, and you negotiate all these priorities on a routine basis. Absolutely, every week our clients come in and they're adjusting the plans based on what their highest priority things are simply by moving these little pieces of paper around. 
Do you guys have a general idea how this works? And just give me a few nods if you understand what we're doing here. You pick up these little folded pieces of paper and you put them on the inscribed box here. Uh, let me show you, just and do training with our, you on our project management system. Add, delete. <laughs> Anybody not catch, let me do it one more. Add, delete, uh, edit. Um, uh, you know, delete, okay? <laughs> and so, and it's pretty clear when the overflow occurs, okay, if you don't fit inside the little inscribed box and that sort of thing. Now, what's amazing is if you think about, um, uh, oh, I don't know, pick your favorite project management system, Microsoft Project, for example, I would have to send you to a week's worth of classes just to teach you how to do what I just taught you there, right? So, so this is a discrete, task on a larger project. Yes. And a project can have, you know, several of these. Several thousand, actually. We, we're one project where we're up to in the 10,000s of the number of these story cards that are on a project. So there's a certain value of writing something down, having it concrete, out there where everybody can see. So, hey, we know what we're going to work on. Yep. And, and there's that, a different part of your brain that gets engaged when you handwrite something rather than cutting and pasting it into a templated document. So we, we actually uh, accept in one um, client that demanded we put them in an electronic system, uh, we, we always handwrite them. I'm not sure if I've handwritten anything for the last five years. Yeah, penmanship <laughs> is actually an important skill at Menlo, especially right. if you're a project manager. But if you suck at penmanship, that's why we have two pair partners. We're hoping one or the other okay. actually has Okay, so you don't hire a Menlo scribe or anything. That's right. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, cool. So, so I mean, this apparently, I, I'm not entirely sold that this <laughs> j brings joy or this, but, but apparently it's gained notice. I mean, this last year here in Ann Arbor, you're... Um, business person of the year, I believe, and, and you've gotten all these different accolades. Menlo itself has become a clearinghouse for how do we do culture. I mean, people are basically beating the path to your door. We had so 340 tours last year for over 2,500 people who came from every continent on the planet to come visit. Ann Arbor. Ann Ar well, Menlo. the basement of a parking structure in Ann Arbor. Uh, and uh, in fact, we had so many visitors that the Ann Arbor Convention and Visitors Bureau named me ambassador of the year because we were bringing so many tourists to Ann Arbor who had to stay in hotel rooms and all this sort of thing. It was, it was the only time my name will ever appear on the, bill, at the, on the uh, scoreboard at Michigan Stadium. It was awesome. <laughs> I got a picture of it on my phone if you want to see it later. Yes. <laughs> So you do use technology? Uh, well, you know, that was, yes, I do. Yeah, I'm not, I, I, I'm a total gadget geek. There's no question about that. Uh, I'm not always perfectly good at learning how to use the gadgets. That's why I had children. <laughs> so, okay, so these guests walk in Menlo. What are, is the average guest sort of, um, oh yeah, this, this makes sense, I get it, and, uh, or, or what's the response that you're getting? From I that? would say that uh, much like uh, you are demonstrating, there is often some healthy skepticism when they walk in the door. Uh, they, they look at two people on one computer and they want to know what's up with that. There's they only one keyboard, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. and they're working on the same task at the same time, and they're thinking, well, why don't we just split these two and get twice as much done, and so we have to explain that, and then they ask very practical questions like, if these people were actually working on my project, do I have to pay for both of them? And of course, the answer is absolutely you do. So then they really want to know why we think there might be value to having two people working together at the same time. Uh, then we show them the paper-based planning. And usually, not always, not 100%, but usually um, there's this sort of aha moment where all of a sudden they start remembering all the problems they have back at their office and they see the simplicity, the clarity, the lack of ambiguity in these tools, these approaches, the transparency in the room because we're all within eye shot, near shot of one another. And now they're confronted with a very scary thing. They realize that maybe they should change to be more like us. And they start contemplating, what would that mean in their world? What would it mean if they gave up their office? What would it mean if they gave away some of their electronic tools in favor of paper? What would it mean if they started sharing their work with another human being? It's a scary thought for a lot of people. Hey, that's, that's actually when I, when I started reading the book, and I, I've been in Menlo a number of different times, both in your um, uh, previous office and now here on Liberty Street, sort of say, okay, who would really want to work 
at a place where you share, it's so democratic, it's so, uh, you know, how do you, get, how do you distribute credit? How do you um, move up in the organization? How do you, you know, who would really want to work there? But apparently people do. Show of hands. Anyone? Anybody? <laughs> you got one up there. All right, Slam awesome. dunk. Not convinced yeah. yet. Yeah, that's okay. I can see it. Okay. Uh, uh, he can't really see us, so I'm not going to raise my hand. I'm a student in his class. and uh, um, No, we, uh, in fact, people regularly offer us their children. This sounds a little weird. <laughs> but it's true. Uh, what happens is, uh, you know, older people come to visit, they see it, and they're like, yeah, this isn't for me, but my kid would love to work here. And suddenly we're getting a resume of a newly minted college grad. And, and so a lot of our, uh, we, we've never had to advertise for positions. We've never had to take out an ad. We've never had to hire a recruiter. Uh, you know, this whole technical challenge of recruiting people, we just don't have that problem. How, 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 do, you, how do you do the interview process? How's that work? Uh, yeah, the interview process is weird. We, ask, we have an interview process where we don't ask any questions. Great. <laughs> Hold on to the Viking helmet. That's right. Yeah. Um, uh, because, uh, because we're a culture-based organization, the first thing we have to do is demonstrate fit for culture. Uh, the way we describe our culture is what you need to work at Menlo is good kindergarten skills. You have to play well with others. You have to share. You have to not run through the room with scissors in your hand over your head. Um, and so it would be very difficult to ask questions to determine if you're a good kindergartner. Let's try it out. David, are you a team player? Oh, yeah, definitely. Oh, do you like people, David? Lo love people. Oh, I always have. awesome. Wow. Hey, David, if you were day of the week, what day would you be? Oh, I would definitely be Monday because I oh. like to get up and get going. I love it. I love Monday morning people, David. That's <laughs> awesome. He's on the team, right? Of course, then he shows up, and we don't have a cube firm or an office or a computer. You know, it, I mean, what, what questions could I possibly ask you that would demonstrate a fit for our culture? So in our world, what we do is we bring a group of people in all at the same time. We pair them during the interview. We give them something to work on. We assign one of my team members to watch you two work together, and we give this you the like weirdest. A, a client project. Uh, no, actually, just it's a, a little. Uh, faux project. It's like, a, yeah, it's it's uh, it's real enough that it demonstrates yeah. the kind of work we do, but it's not an actual client element. Uh, that actually comes in the second interview. Oh, okay. uh, so the first interview is is uh, as you say a faux project, but um, uh, but for 20 minutes you work with another human being. Now we give you the weirdest instructions ever. If uh, let's say you and Matt are paired together, um, uh, your job is to try and get Matt the second interview. Make your, make your partner look good. Now, of course. But of course, I want my. Yeah, you want the second interview. Right. So it, the brains start twisting in the wind, and they're like, well, wait a minute. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, no, but the point is, uh, it, this is improv theater. So, yeah, so do, how, how do people respond to that? I mean, that, is that some okay? respond better than others. Uh, some are really nervous. Uh, we, we know that. Uh, we often see, though, uh, within a few minutes of this pairing exercise, they just disappear into the work. They, it gets noisy, it's, they're collaborating, they're sharing a pencil and a piece of paper together as they work through some problem. Uh, we give you explicit instructions. We, we actually uh, uh, give you um, uh, a couple of pointers to articles before the interview. Their, Inc. Magazine did their cover story on our interview process a couple of years ago, so you can just go online and find out how we interview. We have a white paper on our website that describes it. We actually want you to succeed. We're not trying to hide anything. We're not trying to surprise you. We're not trying to shock you. So we send all this stuff ahead of time so you have the best possible chance to mentally prepare. But once you get going, you revert to form pretty quickly. If you reach over and just grab the pencil out of the other person's hand, our team members thinking to themselves, hmm, would I want to pair with this person <laughs> for so 40 much. hours a week? I don't think so. Uh, but if they see you supporting the other person, if, uh, if Matt's struggling and I watch and you help him out and then he responds, uh, you know, and you, you see Matt's nervous and you calm, down, calm him down by using a little bit of humor and then you get right back to work, uh, you know, we would, we would give you high marks. And then we do that 20 minute exercise three different times. You'd pair with three different people, three different observers, and we send you all home and we talk about what we saw. And if we like enough of what we saw, uh, we invite you back in for a second interview. In that interview, you actually work for a full day by yourself in the room, pairing with two Menlonians for the day, working say in the morning with Ted and in the afternoon with Vera, 
and doing real work on a real client project, then we pay you for that one day. It's a one-day contract. And if that works, we bring you in for a three-week contract. And if that works, uh, the standard joke at Menlo, like Ted would say, is he's on the 400th week of his three-week trial. So. <laughs> Great. So uh, it takes a lot to build a company. And certainly one of those things is vision. But your vision to build Menlo didn't happen in a vacuum. I mean, it happened circumstantially, but also through people. And James uh, mm -hmm. is one of your partners in yes. this endeavor. Um, can you describe to me the importance of having a partner as you're starting a, a company and building a vision and all of that? Yeah, I, I could not and I would not have. I, I could not have done it without James. I would not have done it without James, and I would not have been able to do it without James. Uh, he is, um, you know, we found each other about 14 years ago when I brought him in as a consultant to help me do some fairly simple things compared to Menlo at the time, but we quickly, you know, in a business sense, fell in love with each other. He was suggesting some crazy ideas, and every time he did it, I said yes. And he was a consultant, and he pulled me aside one day, and he says, Rich, you don't understand how consulting works. He says, you have to say no at least once, because then if it, whatever I'm suggesting to you fails, I can go back and say, it's because you said no here, but if you say yes every time, you'll be able to hold me accountable for the results. And I think at that point, we both recognized uh, we'd found two people that were really special, because I was going to say yes every time, and sure, I was going to hold them accountable, but I was in the same canoe he was, and he yeah. knew it. And uh, we, we actually transformed a 30-year-old tired public company to look like what you saw in the video. Uh, it was a company on the west side of Ann Arbor, and over the course of two years, took everyone out of their cubes and offices, transformed them into a place that looked just like Menlo. And in 2001, it was, uh, it was rockin' and rollin'. I was back to joy. I had been a long time in that trough of disillusionment I referred to in the video. Uh, and now I'm back to joy. And then in 2001, it was all taken away from me. Uh, Why? When um, the internet bubble, remember 2001? Were you guys alive <laughs> in 2001? Um, uh, the internet bubble burst. The California company that bought Interface Systems, where I was a VP, shuttered every remote office they had, including uh, the Java factory at Interface Systems, as we called it there. And uh, I was out of work for the first time in my life, and I was 43 years old. And I went home, I told my wife that I'd lost my job, and she looked at me, she had a little bit of tears in her eyes, and she said, you're unemployed? And I said, no, honey, I'm an entrepreneur now. <laughs> and uh, that's when we started Menlo. So, so <clears throat> Ann Arbor is getting a reputation lately for entrepreneurship, and, and you have located strategically on Liberty Street. Does everyone here know where Menlo is located? Hands. Yeah, find one of the parking structures, go into the basement, you'll find us. <laughs> yeah, so it's sort of the corner of Liberty and Thompson, isn't it? Well, or it's Liberty, Liberty it's the Liberty and... Square parking structure, yeah. and if you know where Tech Arb is, you know where Menlo is, because we share a glass wall with Tech Arb. It's underneath the FedEx office if you're really having trouble finding it. Yeah, so you wouldn't necessarily stumble into it, but that, what's interesting about that street is there's a lot of businesses coming yeah. in. Look across the street, you know, I've got a Huntington Bank coming in, you have yeah. new Sweetwaters, um, uh, Google's on that street. I think they brought Sweetwaters in specifically because of me, All not even because drink. of Menlo. Yeah. yeah, I'm just an avid Sweetwaters fan. So. But, what, but you've seen sort of Ann Arbor and its ups and downs, and, and right now, how, how would you um, characterize this moment for entrepreneurship sure. now, and what's happening, and, yep. and the role that Menlo is playing? Historically, I would say this is the second most entrepreneurial period in the history of the town, at least the history of the town that I'm familiar with. Uh, the most entrepreneurial period in the history of Ann Arbor actually occurred in the 70s. Uh, uh, companies like ADP, Manufacturing Data Systems, Sitecore, uh, which created essentially the first personal computer uh, in the 70s, um, uh, Comshare, uh, these were amazing entrepreneurial stories that changed the world. Um, and uh, those guys were just absolutely amazing entrepreneurs. And we're doing some interesting things now. There's no question. There's a lot of entrepreneurial activity. I, I've seen both versions, and we've not approached yet the, the level of entrepreneurial speed, success, and scale that they achieved back in those days. And, and what the primary um, sort of motivator of that entrepreneurship at that time was technology as well? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, ADP created uh, and Comshare created two of the first time-sharing uh, services in the nation where you would, uh, 
Some of you might know this from history books. It used to be that computers were in separate rooms in buildings with lots of air conditioning and there were staff in white coats that would service them and then you would dial into them and your phone would screech until you uh, get connected and that sort of thing. And that's how, that's how ADP and ComShare got their start was they bought the computers, they were very expensive, they were pretty tiny compared to these in terms of capacity and that sort of thing. And then they sold that time over the phone lines to their customers. And uh, then there were companies like MDSI who uh, bought that time from ADP and did things with that time and sold the service to their clients. And MDSI was making a gazillion dollars. They didn't even know what to do with all the cash. So they just started building beautiful buildings up on Plymouth Road. Um, and then Sitecore was a really interesting uh, uh, company. Uh, they, they built these really smart terminals uh, back in those days, which were essentially uh, personal, the forerunner of personal computers. And the thing I remember most about Sitecore, which I sort of confirmed that I had chosen the right career, was I'd go to football games on Saturdays, and I would sit in the stadium as a computer science student, uh, and there would be an airplane flying around the stadium with a banner in the back of it that simply said, Sitecore needs programmers. <laughs> and I Got thought, a job. I'm like, this is the coolest profession ever, right? They advertise for what I do on the banners on, behind airplanes flying around football stadiums. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to have a job after I graduate. Um, and so that was a really cool time. So we have a room full of people that have said at the beginning of the class, many of them want to be entrepreneurs. You had Ann Arbor at a special moment in its entrepreneurial history, um, <clears throat> arguably one of the, one of the most uh, important upward swings we've seen in entrepreneurship in a long time. And we have your company sort of at the heart of it in Liberty Street with a culture full of joy. If some of these students want to come visit Menlo, is that something they can do? And yeah, absolutely. Uh, what I would suggest is since this is a, what, two to three o'clock session, uh, why don't we set up a special event just for them. And uh, after one of these you know, one Friday in the future. And we just say, anybody who wants to come on down Friday afternoon after the entrepreneurship hour. That isn't the only time you can come. You can come any, actually, quite frankly, you can just come anytime you want. Uh, but if you want a little bit more of an official tour, uh, we can accommodate, uh, is Anna in the room? There she is. Uh, Anna will confirm that we can host at least 300 people at a shot, right, Anna? <laughs> Easily. Easy. Yeah, Anna's a little nervous now that I'm offering 300 people uh, a chance to come and visit Menlo, but, um, uh, but no, we can, we can easily set something up for this class if you want, for, you know, and if there's too many to sign up, we can split it into multiple groups, or you can just find, um, we do a lot of tours, they're posted on our website, and you just sign up for public tours and that sort of thing. Great. Well, Rich, it's great to have you here. I want to give a chance for some of the students to ask questions. I, I Hi. Um, you said that um, you do use a lot, you make your employees use their hands a lot because it engages a different part of the brain. What is that, like how is that significant? Like does it make them more creative or? Yeah, and what is your name, sir? I'm Ben. Ben? Yes. Awesome. Um, so Ben, I, uh, I am not a, like a deep expert in cognitive psychology, uh, but there, uh, I think that given the number of uh, sort of uh, nerve endings you have in your fingers and you start writing on paper, for example, when we write these story cards, um, there's, there's something special that's going on. The, the amount of time it takes to write the words, how you think about the words, that sort of thing, the fact that we're using these paper-based tools and that we hand write the story cards that I believe just engages a different part of the brain. Uh, only because uh, what I've watched, and again, some of this is based on my experience in corporate America, when you watch somebody create a document, requirements document, let's say, uh, and they're cutting and pasting things, they don't really read it. You know, uh, it's interesting how often I make this mistake constantly um, uh, where um, uh, I write an email and I push send and then somebody reminds me, oh, Rich, did you see what you wrote there? Oh, yeah. Uh, it's just a different part of your brain when you start handwriting. I don't know if that was, was that your, was that the essence of your question? Hi, I'm Luke. Um, Hi, Luke. So you mentioned for one of your projects or one of your clients, you have over 10,000 of those uh, story cards. Yes. 
It's an eight-year project. We've been working on it for 400 weeks. So. Okay. Yep. But um, how do you keep that organized? Like, do you have to filter through it by hand, uh, through like a giant file cabinet just full of the sheets of paper? Or? Yeah, it's amazing how much, how little of a file drawer you actually need for 10,000 cards. I think it's just a few, about three drawers uh, for holding the cards. And um, the, the cards themselves are um, sort of a bit of processed potato chips for us. We do keep every one of them. We don't lose them. But they're not all active at the same time. The, the, the ones that are actually active, there, there might be a hundred. It's sort of a sliding window over time that a hundred or maybe two hundred are active at any given time period that's of great interest to the current part of the project. The rest of them are historical artifacts that if we really needed to find them, we could go look. And I know a lot of people ask us about that, and they're like, well, do you put them in a database? Well, actually, we do have a spreadsheet that has the title of every card and the number of every card, so we could search the spreadsheet for that. Uh, but we've actually done some simulations with our clients. Uh, you can actually find things faster by leafing through with your fingers and, and flipping through and looking because the brain is such an amazing pattern matching device that we pick up all these subtle clues of color of pen, type of penmanship, diagram on the, and if you, as soon as you put it in standard, you know, Times Roman 12 point font, it all looks the same and it's really hard to find things in a database that way. Um, do you ever think that the progressive culture in your company ever impacts the productivity and people might not take you as seriously as a boss and more as a friend? Sure, what is your name? I'm Katie. Katie. Uh, yes, I believe our progressive culture absolutely affects our productivity. It probably increases it by a factor of 10. Um, it probably went the opposite way you were expecting. Uh, for example, um, so uh, I'll just give you a tangible real world example. Keeley had joined us right out of college. Um, she, was, uh, uh, she was working for us for a few weeks. And when she got home one day, uh, her friends called her and they said, Keely, are you mad at us? She said, no, why? Well, we've been texting you, we've been emailing you, we've been instant messaging you, and you don't respond. She goes, oh, I, I'm working now, I got a job. And they said, oh, well, we're working too, but we can do all that stuff while we're working. And she said, oh, I can't, I'd be letting my peer partner down. Nobody was watching her, nobody was overseeing her. She felt a personal accountability to the person who was sitting next to her. So one of the things you see at Menlo is that it's very focused activity. Uh, it's actually, you go in, it's a noisy environment, but as the noise of work, there's not much chit chat going on at Menlo. It's actually productive work. Now one of the reasons we can do that is we only work eight hour days and we only work 40 hour weeks and we never work weekends and we never deny vacation requests, which is kind of crazy for a software company. Most software companies operate in death march mode. Well, if you operate in death march mode for too long, people started having to jam their personal lives in and around work, and that's when they start bringing all that non-productive stuff into the workplace. We don't have to do that. Anyone want to work at Menlo now? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, there we go. All right, so time for one more question. Got a question right here, and then we're gonna close up uh, class. Hi, my name's Hi. William. Hi, um, William. As an entrepreneur, uh, one usually has to seek a group, partners like you did, um, and has to seek a patent. How does one go about doing that without having to worry about people stealing their ideas? Yeah, um, so I think you'll get this kind of answer from a lot of people like me is that ideas, it's not that you just shouldn't protect them at all, but I would suggest to you that ideas are kind of a dime a dozen. You and I could sit here right now and come up with five world-changing ideas before three o'clock. But if we don't execute on any of them, it doesn't matter. And if your idea stays stale, if it doesn't, if you have an idea and you share it in front of this room right now, and it doesn't change an ounce <coughs> in, over the next year because you just weren't thinking about it, it probably wasn't a very good idea anyways. The fact matter is that if you and I come together, you share your idea with me, you tell me all about it, uh, and then the next day you're already thinking up new things. You're taking it in a slightly new direction. You're pivoting into a new direction because you have conversations with people. I might have the same, I might take your idea and start running with it, but by the time I get done with it, I've taken it way over here, you've taken it way over there. So 
I, again, I, I don't want to minimize the, um, uh, the importance of patents and trade secrets and non-disclosure agreements and that sort of thing, but you will, you will move an idea along farther and more productively by sharing it with others than you will by keeping it all to yourself. Uh, you might remember, um, uh, what was the uh, Pirates of the Caribbean? Was that the one with Jack? And he had one silver bullet in his gun and he never fired it. Am I remembering the story right? It's close enough, okay. <laughs> My daughter's over there. She's like, yeah, well, I'll explain it to you later, Dad. Uh, and, uh, but the point is that ideas, a lot of ideas for entrepreneurs are like that silver bullet. They keep them tucked in their vest pocket and they never fire them. And literally you could look over that entrepreneur's, you know, at their final resting place and see that there's this bulge in their pocket where they never fired their silver bullet. And it's kind of sad. So I would suggest that you're going to get greater benefit by sharing it with others because it'll make it better. So I'd like to invite all those students that ask questions to come up and pick up their copy of Rich's book for free. The rest of you, if you'd like to purchase one, they're available. Rich, thank you so much for uh, coming and for joining.